Welcome to the Deck 4 podcast. You can access episodes, companion articles, research notes and links, as well as information about our contributors and supporters at deck4podcast.com. Hope you enjoy the program. Now, it's probably not surprising Colonel Parker wasn't wasn't 100% happy with um, the final result. One of his objections was the fact that um, they had focused on some of the catering at the hotel, the big sides of meat, the you know the opulence of the surroundings. He was concerned that people in some of the less affluent uh, cities that might have um, come to see the film perhaps had to make some sacrifices that week. That they might feel a bit alienated by the um, by the opulence. Colonel Parker apparently was also unhappy about the fact that they were sort of virtually discussing a league table of who was the biggest attractions, um, whether it was Streisand or Sinatra or Elvis. Parker always thought everybody there's room for everybody. Everybody can just basically work in their own universe, and it's not a it's not a competition. The issue of, of the fact that um, he's concerned about alienating some of the um, the less affluent fans, I think that that is um, that's something that appeals to me. And I know his faults have been well documented, and we know um, that he was far from perfect. But there are a few little things about the old Colonel that you know I think are to be admired. Yeah, that's very Colonel him having that that uh, issue keep it simple Elvis is a simple humble guy keep it simple but and I understand him bringing that up but it's almost pointless too because Las Vegas is about opulence anyways and you know Joe Blow who lives out in the sticks what is he sitting when he's sitting there thinking in his bedroom watching Carson late at night he's thinking Vegas he's thinking that's that's the pinnacle and then he goes to his local movie house and sees Presley there in Vegas and he sees the opulence I mean it would it just it just would have drove tourism I think it it's a confirmation see I was right Vegas look at that I got to get there I got to go there cuz look at that hunk of meat you know what I mean so I don't know Colonel always had his own way and to bring that up makes sense for me knowing what I know about Colonel but to me, that was just more a, a, a diamond, you know, a, a, a glistening thing, a reason to go there. But Gary, one of the things we talked about uh, on Elvis, that's the way it is, was the fact that Colonel Parker was unhappy with certain aspects of the rough cut. And um, he actually articulated those objections in a lengthy memo, um, interestingly, not to uh, Herbert Solo, the producer, but to James Aubrey, the corporate head of MGM. And I'm referring to Peter Gorolnik's um, Careless Love, um, the biography that we both think very highly of. And uh, Peter Gorolnik goes through some of Colonel's objections that he wrote in this memo. But this is Peter Gorolnik's take on it. He says, most of all, without ever actually naming it, what the Colonel really seems to be objecting to is the director's implicit contempt for his subject. So do you think that's, I mean, we talked about Dennis Sanders' motivation, some of his editorial choices. Do you think Peter Gorelnik's observation about this contempt is fair? Well, I I didn't see that at all. I, I hate to go against Peter Gorelnik. I'm willing to admit that he knows a little bit more than I do about the, the situation. I was trying to, after you mentioned this to me, trying to uh, look at things again to see if I could see what was going on there, and um, I just couldn't. The only thing I can think of is that with all of the Elvis things that have happened, particularly since his death, all of the takes on Elvis and all of the, you know, the cultural opinions about him, perhaps he went back almost in a revisionist sort of way and and looked again at the things depicted in the movie and thought well maybe that could be uh, depicted better or shown better or i can i can get this from that scene or i can put this spin on it but but it's funny you know that's the way it is as you and i spent a lot of time nailing down is just it's just a wonderfully magnificent document of this certain time in elvis's life and to hear that there was you know, issues with the depictions. Uh, no, to answer your question, I, I didn't see that at all in the film. In fact, Colonel Parker was quite complimentary in his memo to James Aubrey. Parker was actually quite complimentary. He said this, Mr. Dennis Sanders did a tremendous job with great enthusiasm and dedication. We are endeavouring to help put it together on a professional commercial basis. Uh, now, he's obviously very um, cosy with James Aubrey because there's a very uh, nice little personal bit here. Jim, as you know, Elvis, you and I believed in this idea from the start. I tried to sell the idea for the past 10 years, but no one would or could see it. We are all grateful for your belief in it. So this is interesting in that 
James Aubrey was obviously a key part of putting it all together. Yeah, that's interesting. And it's it's no surprise, really, that uh, Colonel would have gone right to the top to make this yes. happen. So that makes sense to me. He, he likes to rub elbows and to do a bit of battle with people like this. So, so here's something that worked out really well. So it would be a, a, an after the fact commiserating of, you know, gosh, look at us. Didn't we do great? You know, Elvis was good too, but man, we really put it together. And uh, so that, ma- that makes perfect kernel sense. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you're right. Okay, here we go. The anticlimax of a director's ending tacked on to follow the climax of Elvis's stage show. The frequent cut-ins on Elvis's performance with great disadvantage to getting across seeing Elvis as he really is performing. But obviously something that he did succeed in getting removed was some some disparaging references to Blue Hawaii and GI Blues. Um, I I believe the slurs on Blue Hawaii and G.I. Blues should be completely removed as these were two of the most successful films ever made by Elvis. They did not deserve to be mentioned uh, just as trash in such a way. All interview footage uh, ought to be thoroughly checked so that it doesn't become monotonous and take away from the performance as these are Garanik's words, uh, the smarmy dismissal of Las Vegas itself for the kind of conspicuous consumption that could only alienate Elvis's true fans. There's no reason to show an abundance of stakes in a truck in this picture when perhaps in Dalton, Georgia, where the picture may be showing, a family saved up money to see the picture and relinquished their hamburger for that night so they could see Elvis. So how do you see how the Colonel was sort of thinking about the film or framing his objections? I alluded to it earlier. It's hard maybe to criticize the Colonel in his business dealings The man had an eye to a buck for sure. Interesting that you note that Colonel doesn't want you to talk ill of Blue Hawaii and GI Blues. Because they were big money makers, Colonel says you shouldn't talk bad about them. But perhaps what was happening was somebody was making a a comparison. Look at the family-friendly, safe, easy, singing to babies type character he was in these early films. Now we have him here in Las Vegas and he's dynamic and, and, and that's a legitimate point. That's a point I think we all have tried to make in the past. So, but it's Colonel who, now don't disparage those films because they made money. Never, it would never occur to him well, he wasn't depicted as cool as he could have been in those films or whatever. It's funny, those two films are two of my favorites. But I can understand from a critical standpoint, you wanting to make a comparison. Interesting that he talks about the steaks and the poor couple who can't have a hamburger that night. That is so Colonel, so Carnival Barker who knows, you know, how people spend their money and the entertainment they want. And But at the same time, I would think the Las Vegas people would want to show Las Vegas in all its opulence to help to drive tourism. Perhaps Colonel has got a foot in reality and says, you can do that all you want. People are not going to be able to afford a trip to Las Vegas. But then the back and forth is, well, shouldn't we depict every moment of an experience in Las Vegas? Because this is all the people are going to get. The same with the performances on stage. You could argue, Put the camera on a tripod, aim it at Elvis and let him go. This is a wonderful film document. To cut in with interviews, yeah, it's always one of the things that rankled me about that film that I love. That's the way it is. The people interviewed in the middle of a performance, plus it's not like they're so compelling and, you know, they add so much. And did you hear the way James Burton hit that riff? Like they're not adding much to it. They're talking about their own lives or whatever. They're talking about things that I, frankly, I can't remember at all. But I remember Elvis singing, You've Lost That Love and Feeling. So interesting complaints that make sense, but don't. And you can go back and forth forever. But, you know, leave it to Colonel to pick out all those things and to want to fight for, I mean, not the art part, but, you know, the buck and how this film should be presented. It's not surprising to hear any of that. And like I say, you could debate back and forth for days on those things. Podcast terms and conditions can be found at our website, deck4podcast.com. You can contact us there or on our social media. Find us on the major podcasting platforms, and we're also on Substack, Facebook, Tumblr, and Instagram. This has been George Fairbrother. Thanks for listening.